Hi everyone and thanks for joining us. This is Britt King. Today, Danny Cohen will speak about the challenges of monitoring distributed systems and show how Service Pulse was designed to solve them. Danny, it's all yours. Thank you, Britt. And uh, we've got a full uh, agenda today, so let's get started. And thanks for joining us for, um, for this uh, presentation for this webinar. The agenda that we'll be covering today uh, is before you. Hopefully you can see it on your screen. Yes. And we'll start with a platform and architecture overview for the uh, particular service platform. And then we'll, we'll zoom in on production monitoring with Service Pulse. And we'll review the various topics covered by Service Pulse, various features in it, heartbeats, custom checks and custom, uh, to monitor custom dependencies, exceptions and errors, and activity monitoring in general. And we'll see various demos that uh, demonstrate those uh, features. Then we'll move on to planning and configuration considerations, architectural, management, DevOps, uh, that uh, relate to various topics that you should consider when you start using Service Pulse in particular for production monitoring and also may apply to other tools as well. Uh, finally, we'll go through a short list of resources in which you can learn more, and then we'll reach a uh, QA uh, section in which I, I'll try, will try to answer all your, to answer all your questions. So, let's start with the platform and architecture review, and uh, of course, let's start with N-Service Bus. N-Service Bus is the core of the particular service platform. It's been in production for six or so seven years now. Uh, with an extremely wide adoption across many business domains and uh, many usage scenarios it was implemented on. It provides extensible messaging and workflow. It supports one-way full duplex, uh, publish, subscribe, and other patterns. And it does so on top of transports like MSMQ, RabbitMQ, and various Azure transport implementation. It also includes the Saga workflow engine that provides long-running and time-bound workflows. The goal of N-Service Bus is to allow developers to focus on their core logic, fully abstracting themselves from the underlying infra infrastructure, therefore enabling much improved productivity and time to market and uh, reliability. Service Matrix is, extends N-Service Bus and is built on top of N-Service Bus. It provides an intuitive modeling and design environment that allows visualizing complex interaction, which is a key to designing better distributed systems. It provides a drag and drop design environment that's fully integrated into Visual Studio 2012 and Visual Studio 2013. And Service Matrix allow you, allows you to quickly model your distributed system, including the various components in it, endpoints, messages, interactions, etc., and make communicating your intent while designing that system much, much easier, much more intuitive, and the system that you've designed is fully functional. All it awaits is your uh, very specific business logic that you need to hook in to the uh, skeleton that uh, Service Matrix creates. Alongside Service Matrix, there's Service Insight. This is a tool for advanced distributed system debugging. It provides with complete under the hood view of your system's behavior, and it clearly displays and visualizes its behavior during runtime. It provides multiple views so that you can see how your system behaves in runtime from multiple perspectives. And the data that is underlies those views, that is represented in those views, is immediately available and up to date. It can be used in de development environments, in testing, in staging, and also in production environment. And we'll see how it can be used alongside Service Pulse today. And, of course, the star of the evening is Service Pulse. Service Pulse is an integrated production monitoring, integrated with, with N-Service Bus and the particular service platform. It keeps track of your system as endpoint health, its behavior with various messages. It monitors any processing errors. It's a, it can allow you to detect those errors, get information regarding failed message processing, and also send failed messages for reprocessing. And it also allows you to make sure that whatever specific environment requirements you have, whatever specific needs your endpoint have, they will be met. And if not, you will be alerted about that. More about that coming soon. 
Um, regarding service matrix and service insight, we had a previous webinar in which we went into considerable detail in demoing it, uh, showing its features, its capabilities, and that uh, webinar is, the webinar's recording is available online in the following uh, link, videos and presentation in the particular .NET uh, <clears throat> website. Please feel free to review it. Um, I don't assume prior knowledge of uh, service insight or service matrix, so that is uh, something that uh, is not required for uh, this specific session, but you might find it interesting to take a look at those two tools as well, since they're very complementary and are an integrated part of the particular service platform. So these are the tools that comprise the particular service platform, and in general, we've uh, invested a lot in making the overall experience provided by these tools to be both integrated and overall providing uh, uh, the uh, features that together work to make the platform reliable, maintainable, and scalable to allow you to develop uh, distributed systems that are easy to maintain, to change code, to adapt, to uh, scale out or scale up, um, that allow you to uh, treat your messages and your interactions in your distributed system systems reliably using exception management that you can trust. And we'll take a, uh, quite a few uh, demos about that today. And of course, everything with high performance, extensibility, customization, etc. For more information, please take a look at uh, this link, the service platform link. It provides a lot of information, both at uh, the high level and links for detailed description about how each of those te of these tenets, reliability, maintainability, and scalability, are implemented using the platform. So, having reviewed the um, platform in general, let's take a Let's dive deeper a bit and see how the platform looks from the architectural perspective. So this is how we envision the interactions uh, between the various components we've, which we've just reviewed. And let me address those. First of all, we have the end service bus endpoints. We have quite a few of these. Each system may have one, two, ten, 100 endpoints. Uh, depends on your needs and requirements. Now, those endpoints uh, can be configured to audit their messages into uh, dedicated queues, and we'll talk a bit about that in the future. And those queues are monitored by service control. I haven't talked about service control yet, but service control is the secret ingredient behind the scenes of uh, all of the tools that uh, we'll be seeing today. It collects the information from the queues, it stores them into an embedded database, and provides, exposes inf that information to Service Insight for advanced debugging, for Service Pulse, for production monitoring, and also to Service Matrix for enabling various aspects of the design and modeling uh, features. So the information flows from the endpoints through uh, reliable messaging infrastructure that uh, uses essential queues into a database that stores that information and expo processes that information and exposed, exposes that information, those messages, and the, their metadata to the various tools provided by the platform. And now let's talk a bit about what actually do we want to monitor when we talk about production monitoring. Well, first of all, there's the issue of health. Is my system healthy? Now, you may ask that in various forms, like for example, is my, are my endpoints active? Are they alive? Are, are they able to send messages? Are they able to communicate? A second way of asking this is, are my custom dependencies, for example, storage, database, file system, communication with other third-party services, etc., cetera, are, are these specific requirements that are unique to my system and even vary among various among each endpoints, are they uh, meeting their requirements, both in terms of availability, performance, etc. There's also the question of exceptions. Are there any exception of the exceptions that occurred in my system? Were there any processing errors during the processing of the various messages I sent or received? And of course, there's the ongoing activity of uh, monitoring for statistics like how many messages per second have I uh, received and processed during the last X time span. So these are the things we'd like to monitor, and I'd like to show you in this uh, webinar how we address each and every one of those of these features: health, customized dependencies that are specific or unique to your system, and various endpoints, exceptions, and activity. 
But before we do that, let's talk a bit about service pools. Um, one of the primary design principles, uh, some of the primary design principles we had in mind when uh, we went uh, and w went ahead and implemented this product was to provide central monitoring for all of the system endpoints. All of your system endpoints, regardless of how many there are, can connect and audit their data so that uh, Service Pulse through Service Control can collect that information and provides and provide the uh, alerts and, and notifications that we'll see uh, shortly in the various demos. And when displaying that information, we took a very clear approach of clearly indicating the status in a binary way. Either things are okay or things are not uh, okay. In this, in, this, in this sense, we strive to be unambiguous as possible. Clearly indicate when something is wrong or when something is okay. And if it is wrong, then allow any person to clearly understand, even at a glance, uh, when something is wrong and what requires attention. We also uh, are interested in providing near real-time and as up-to-date as possible display of your status. And we're using SignalR and various push technologies uh, to provide notifications and alerts about uh, in the UI and also through API. And we'll also provide a, uh, an upcoming webinar that will be discussing those aspects of uh, accessing the system's information, service control and service policy information through, access, through uh, API and uh, extensibility points. We made sure that uh, Service Pulse and Service Control in general and also Service Insight work with all of the end service bus out of the box transports. Uh, whether it's MSMQ, SQL Server, uh, Azure Queues, Azure Service Bus, etc. And also it works with end service bus version 4 but it also, well actually it also supports version 3.3.8 or later. End service bus version 3.3.8. When Considering the uh, health, health monitoring and reporting about how the system behaves, whether it is healthy and working uh, in according, with, according to the specification and requirements, we're taking on the point of view of the endpoint itself. We believe that we believe in the in the services approach of uh, smart endpoints and dumb pipes. So we're looking at how the endpoint looks at the world. So understanding what's going on from the point of view of the endpoint itself and within the specific process running under a specific set of credentials and permissions and limitations, and that is critical in order to get a realistic display of the system health. For example, my machine may be able to communicate to the internet, but well given my specific process credentials, the credential under which my endpoint is running, I may not be able to connect to the internet because there's a specific net, uh, proxy rule that uh, disallows it. So this is something we need to monitor and we need to detect that using production monitoring for each and every endpoint. And of course, again, extensible and customizable, um, for example, by allowing operations personnel or DevOps to customize the definition of what is a healthy endpoint? What do I expect before I, what do I expect to happen uh, before I can conclude that my endpoints and my system in general are indeed healthy? So this is based on very specific endpoint requirements or very specific system requirements and we allow you to customize, to customize based on that. These are the, the design principles again of, that led us in the design of Service Pulse and um, um, please keep those in mind as we go through the demos and the presentation today. Another topic that serves as an infrastructure for service pulse is the issue of endpoint auditing. We've mentioned that and in the previous architecture slide, uh, but let me iterate that a bit because it's extremely important to understand how it relates to the overall experience of service pulse. The auditing, uh, the central auditing feature that uh, comes out of the box with uh, and service bus allows you to point every each and every endpoint that you have uh, to audit all its messages and processing errors into central queues, audit queue and error queue. It's a, it's an easy to configure um, settings in each and every one of the endpoints. You can see an example of the how to configure that in this slide, and that is something that we definitely we 
rely on for the functionality of Service Pulse. We actually extend that uh, by providing extended auditing with service control plugins. These are plugins that hook in, that uh, are deployed and referenced by each and every endpoint that you would like to um, add that, that extended auditing to. What you, can see, what you see before you are, uh, the, well, basically the NuGet console command lines uh, that allow you to add a heartbeat or a custom check or a Saga audit um, plug to each and every one of your endpoints. And once you those endpoints are uh, functional inside of your endpoints, it allows your endpoint to start reporting information that uh, is relevant for heartbeats and health and custom checks for custom dependencies, Saga activity, and more. And let's start with visualizing what's going on when it comes to monitoring health and specifically the example of endpoint heartbeats. So endpoint heartbeats are basically heart, uh, a message that is sent by the heartbeat plugin that is loaded into each and every one of your endpoints. And it is configured by default to send a heartbeat message every 10 seconds to the control queue where it is being picked up by service control into the, its, it, into its embedded database and then it is reported by Service Pulse. Now Service Pulse expects that every endpoint it identifies uh, emits a heartbeat periodically. And if uh, the endpoint misses that period of expectation by Service Pulse, then Service Pulse will alert that, hey, I did not receive uh, any, any, any such heartbeat. So the endpoint may be, for example, able to send that heartbeat, but if send, service control may, uh, is not being is not able to receive that, then it then service pulse will indeed um, alert that, and that may be an indication of a, um, for example, the machine in which that endpoint is deployed is not able to communicate to the outside world. So sending is one thing, receiving it is another, and we're relying on being able to receive those messages. And without further ado, let's see how it works. Let's see an example of how it works. Okay, so first of all, this is the Service Pulse UI, and it's a very clean UI. The database is empty, there's nothing in there. And what I'd like to show you is how uh, Service Pulse detects that uh, new endpoints are function functional and become and starts expecting those endpoints' heartbeats to be accepted. Let me go to a, uh, a solution I have here. This is the video store sample that we've been uh, using for the past several years. And uh, this video st store sample has several endpoints, about five, six endpoints. And it, st it will start sending, and I've already deployed the various plugins into each of those endpoints. What I basically did is I went to each and every endpoint's NuGet, pack, NuGet uh, console, and I added the custom check, heartbeats, and saga audit uh, um, plugins, all except one, which is the operations uh, endpoint. To that, I did not add the heartbeats. Uh, regarding why I did not add the heartbeats, I'll show you in a second. But note that the operation uh, endpoint does not have the heartbeat plugins. Okay, so let's uh, launch it. Let's arrange the windows so that we'll see in the background what happens as soon as those endpoints start reporting their existence. Okay. So first of all, I can see that uh, there are notifications that several endpoints have been detected. For example, the sales endpoint is detected and uh, it needs to, uh, a plugin needs to be installed, and uh, let's see what the active endpoints window tells me. It tells me that I have four endpoints. I should have five. I'll tell, uh, in a minute, I'll show you where the fifth one, uh, how the fifth one appears. And I can see that the latest heartbeat was received a few seconds ago. And as it continues, messages and uh, excuse me, heartbeat messages are being received every every 10 seconds. As we've discussed, this is the default interval. Now, currently, it does not identify the operations um, endpoint. Why is that? Because well, 
it did not receive any message from any heartbeat message from the operations endpoint, and it also did not receive any standard message from the operations endpoint. So what I can do uh, quite easily is go to the sample UI for the video store and send a uh, request, a purchase request, simulate the activity of the de of the application that I am um, monitoring. And I'll place an order. Yep, and an order is placed. And as soon as that happens, I'll be able to start seeing that an endpoint, here we go, that um, a new video, a video store operations endpoint was detected. And it needs to be, mon to be, in order for it to be monitored, a plugin needs to be installed. So it tells me that something is wrong. The, obviously, it's thread. So let's click it and see what's going on. The operations appear, operations endpoint appear in the in active endpoints section, telling me clearly that no plugin is installed. Okay, so what do I do now? Well, I can do one of several things. I can decide that, well, I'm not really interested in monitoring this endpoint, so I can go to the configuration section. And here I have a list of all the detected endpoints. And I can uncheck the operations endpoint. Basically, I can tell it that um, I do not want that this endpoint to be monitored, and I do not want alerts to be received if heartbeats are not re uh, alerts to be sent if heartbeats are not received from this endpoint. If I do so, you can check it. You can go back. You can see that the dashboard has been updated, and the list of active and inactive endpoints have been, has been active, uh, updated as well. Basically, taking the operations endpoint and marking it as irrelevant for monitoring purposes. Why would I want to do that for any endpoint? We'll discuss several scenarios in a second. But for now, let me go back to the operate to the configuration window, and let me check it again, so that I'll continue monitoring it. And as you can see, it it's telling me that the endpoint configuration was updated for the operations, and the um, Endpoint again is marked as inactive. How can I fix that? So what I can do is go back to my endpoint and basically open a console window, a new bit console, operations, and I'll put in this command, install package service control plugin heartbeat, and install the heartbeat plugin. Let's give it a second. Thank you. And all it adds is a single reference to the heartbeat DLL. Once I restart it, let's go back. As you can see, there's been a couple of uh, heartbeats that were marked as inactive because I stopped the, their activity. But once I uh, load, once I load those endpoints again then Service Pulse will detect that and quite easily and quite quickly indicate that the endpoint heartbeats have been restored for the various endpoints, including, let's uh, take a look at it, yes, including for the operations um, endpoint. And if I click on it, then you'll see that on the list of active endpoints, I have the operations endpoint, which I just added the heartbeat plugin to, and it started sending um, the heartbeat message as a few seconds ago. Okay, so let's go back to our presentations and, and, and discuss what we've just seen. The general approach of um, managing the endpoints is that there are endpoints we want to monitor and there are endpoints we may want to avoid monitoring. Why would we want to avoid monitoring an, an, an endpoint? Well, an endpoint may be obsolete. For example, uh, it was registered in the past, but we shut it down because the VM or the machine on which it was uh, active has been shut down and it was moved or integrated or something happened to it that make, made it go away. It's no longer relevant. So we do not delete it from our auditing database. That's not something we'd like to do. We'd like to keep all that information there. Uh, but what we would do is mark it as something we would not, not like to. We would not like to monitor. We do not want to be disturbed, and we do not want the Service Pulse UI to be cluttered with information regarding the specific endpoint. It's uh, it's meaningless for us. So that's one reason why we may want to 
mark an endpoint as something we do not want to monitor. Another case, another scenario is because we want to temporarily shut down for maintenance a specific endpoint, and again, we do not want to be to receive false uh, negatives regarding the availability of that endpoint. So we can mark an endpoint as monitored and unmonitored. There may be other issues that are not functioning as expected, but that can be covered by other aspects. What basically the, the, mark, the marking of an endpoint is, is that uh, the endpoint is able to send heartbeat messages at specified intervals and communicate with service control. That's a lot, but it's not everything. So, for example, there may be scenarios in which um, an active, an active endpoint is taken offline, and I would like to discuss whether it is indeed active or inactive. For example, ASP.NET, in certain cir cir circumstances, may take a, a host offline, may take up a, an app host and hybrid and move it to uh, mark it as idle for after a period of idleness and take it offline uh, until uh, it is recalled or reactivated as a response to a user action. So if I have that endpoint marked for monitoring, I will receive indications that it is no longer active, that it is inactive, when ASP.NET marks it as idle and removes it, removes the application host. So that is something we need to consider and configure according, accordingly. Basically, active endpoint means that it is able to send um, messages, and those messages are received, can be received and processed as expected. But a more in-depth health verification is something that we really need. We need to monitor uh, more situations that are more custom-tailored to the requirements of my endpoint. And that is something we'll review with custom ch checks. And custom checks is all about dependencies and even in specific dependencies that relate to my specific implementation or scenarios and requirements. And, the, and the, the basic first question that we need to ask when coming to, when considering whether or not and if so, what kind of custom checks we need to develop, the basic question is, what does my endpoint depend on? What is it that my endpoint cannot function if without it? It may be um, a storage, whether it's a database or access to a uh, file system. It may be connection to the internet or to some specific subnet or a uh, list of servers that it must access or external services that must be available and accessible from my specific endpoint. And also it may be a specific authentication and authorization to access those uh, external services or other components that it must have access to. So all these are very specific to your needs and to your environment. And these, and these are the, uh, basically the building blocks of custom checks. You should consider whether to author and deploy custom checks to check for these specific dependencies. Once you author them, and it's quite easy, we'll see that in a second, um, and, you and you deploy them into your endpoints, they will start reporting when things are going fine and, more importantly, when things are breaking, when the um, requirements are not met, and Service Pulse will alert us about that. So, what does it take to develop and author a custom check? Well, a few short, uh, a few short steps. Uh, you can create a class library. You, you can actually do that within the endpoint code itself, but that's considered, well, it's more of a best practice to develop a dedicated library for custom checks. And you add a reference to the NuGet custom checks plugin, as I, uh, as I did with the heartbeats, similarly. And you author a custom check uh, class that derives from a custom check or periodic check. And what it basically does is implement a single uh, function, a single method called perform check. You can see a sample implementation before you that uh, uh, simulates a, an internet availability check, whether I can connect to the internet. Once I build that specific class library, I'll take the DLL and uh, copy and paste it to the endpoint bin directory. I can also reference it from the endpoint, but I can just as well just drop it. And uh, it will be loaded dynamically when the endpoint is restarted, is started or restarted. And to the endpoint itself, I need to add, uh, again, a custom checks plugin reference 
similarly to what I did with the class library itself. So both needs to have both uh, the endpoint and the DLL uh, need to have a reference to the custom checks. And uh, let's see a demo of that. Okay, let's go back here and first of all, let's see a piece of code that implements that. Let's start with the internet availability check. Okay, so first of all, a class, a simple class implements periodic check or inherits from, um, and it provides a name, a unique name, user-friendly name, and a category. And it also specified in this case, periodic check implies that it's, well, scheduled to run periodically. In this case, I'm providing a time span of five seconds. I may want to give a uh, longer or even shorter time span, but five seconds seems to be uh, good enough for the purposes of this specific demo. And in the perform check function, I'm checking for internet connection. And if I uh, can't connect, I'll send a failure message. And if I can connect, I'll return a pass. Now, what does the check internet connection function do? It does something very simple. It checks whether there is a directory on my machine that um, is named checks internet. That's how you connect. That's how you check for internet connection in this specific demo. So, and this is already deployed with all of the various uh, components. So let's see how it behaves. Okay, this is the directory C checks internet, and let me change the name of this directory to something that is not as expected. And within five seconds, I should be able to see four uh, endpoints commenting that internet availability check, internet connection is not available. Okay, And well, it's very simple stuff. If I change it back, then again, within five seconds, I'll be able to see it being restored and working as expected. Now I can have as many custom checks as I'd like. Um, performing what various uh, checks. Note that, it do, that uh, the custom checks do run within the um, endpoint process. So keep in mind that whatever is being done uh, in that endpoint process is not consuming too much uh, resources. Uh, we'll discuss more about various resources consideration in the planning and configuration uh, section uh, later in the webinar. Uh, but uh, overall, these are the custom checks. Basically, take a simple class, define the thing that you want to check for, implement that, deploy that, and have Service Pulse report to you when any of the um, requirements you've specified using the custom checks are not met, met. So that was a demo for custom checks. And let's uh, move on. Let's see what happens with uh, exceptions and errors. So, um, as we've said previously, using the auditing mechanism um, provided by InService Pulse, all of the endpoints forward their failed messages to a central error queue. You should configure them to do so. That's the, that's the best practice. And once I have a failed message, failed meaning that the message, uh, that the um, processing endpoint that's receiving the message failed to process that endpoint, then a uh, then the failed message exception that will be received in the error queue will include the full exception stack trace and that will be displayed by service pulse. Also the message body will be displayed by service pulse. And I can also from service pulse in a launch service insight to provide me with additional details in depth analysis about uh, the complete conversation in which the failed messages uh, uh, existed the headers, the message body, the uh, performance indicators, performance time spans for those, for those failed messages. And I can also take several actions. I can decide to retry one or more times manually or automatically using first level retries or second level retries. I'll address that in a second. Or I can decide to archive it, to archive the failed message. Basically put it aside so it does not clutter my UI and um, that is basically something I need to consider when reprocessing is not an option or when I resent that message or another message that substitutes that original message and that original message uh, should be discarded and well remain in the database as an archive message but still not clutter my UI. 
<clears throat> so let's see a demo of how this works. Again, the UI, and let's see some code first. Let's go to my favorite, let's go back to my favorite endpoint, the operations endpoint. And here is a handler that handles the message. It does what it does, and then it checks that uh, i does not equal zero. Of course, i should not equal zero, but let's, let's imagine for a second that i does equal zero. Let me stop this for a second. Let's change it. And now I should fail in the operations uh, endpoint with something really bad happened, message description. Let's see how the system behaves. Hmm. Excuse me, I clicked on the wrong button here. Let me do that again. I accidentally closed the UI that, will, that I will need. And as you can see, the endpoints are starting to um, report that heartbeats are not received. Shortly, they'll start reporting that heart, heartbeats are received, since I'm reloading those heartbeats. Thank you. We're green again. And let's open up the uh, Service Insight UI. This is Service Insight, for those who, of you who are um, possibly familiar or unfamiliar with it. Currently, it's empty. Um, And if I refresh the screen for a second, you'll see that it already identifies the endpoints. And I've got one or more messages. And this is basically how it looks. I've got a submit order, order placed, order accepted. And I've got a provision download request message that is being sent to the operations. Let me zoom in a bit. To the operations processing endpoint. This will fail. Let's see how it fails. So first of all, let me sort that by time sent. And let me also turn on auto refresh that will display, it will update the display every second. Let me move it aside for a second. And let's get the ball rolling. Placing an order. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Now, on the endpoint side, here's how it looked. Uh, the endpoint, the operations endpoint, received the message. It uh, went through a few cycles of first level retries, meaning it tried to do to uh, rerun the reprocess the message several times in quick succession, but it failed. And since I've met, I've uh, disabled for the purposes of this de uh, this demo, I dis disabled second level retries SLR it immediately uh, moved it to the error queue. And once it's in the error queue, I was a, I'm now able to see this. I'm now able to see this information that indicates that this message failed. If I go back to the service pulse UI, I see that I have one failed message. Let's click it, let's see what's going on here. And yes, indeed, something really bad happened. I can, I can see the information, where it happened. If I want to, I can show the full stack trace. And in a, um, the next minor release, I will also be able to show you the message body from within uh, Service Pulse. Currently, you can you know, simply launch Service Insight and see the message body inside of uh, Service Insight, if you'd like. Let's also store this so that I can see the messages. Let's hide the stack trace. Let's, you know what, let's create another um, another message so that I'll have another fail messages message to play with. It should fail in a second or so. Yep, I've got one new message and now I've got two failed messages. Okay, so uh, let's see what the stack trace tells me. It tells me that in the provision download handler, in this file in specific line, I've got a problem. So let's go back to the code. 
and of course it failed because I should always be one should always be equal to one that means let me start it again and now I'm stuck with two failed messages I can see that in uh, the service pulse UI and I can also see that in the uh, service insight UI let me just sort it by status I've got two failed messages and now uh, let me just make sure that I've been yep all endpoints are loaded and I've got two failed messages so what do, what can I do now I can um, select a single message or I can select all the messages and I can retry all the messages in this case I'd like to retry the one selected message so that afterwards I can archive one message and we'll talk about archiving for a bit but let's do something simple let's retry one selected message clicking Here we go, in the operation endpoint, received the uh, message and processed it. I've, I've now I now have one failed message. I can also see that if I refresh in uh, Service Insight, that I have one failed message that remains. Now, let's see what archive means. I can select this message and uh, define that it will be archived, meaning that I'll be marking, marking it as something that cannot be fixed or should not be fixed. It, as I said, it may have been, may, the underlying issue may have been resolved by sending another uh, correct message so that resending this message is problematic uh, or not good. <laughs> Uh, sending double messages is definitely not a good option when you've already resent a previous message that was processed. So I may decide to archive it. What does archiving mean? It will be stored in the database for future reference if required. And uh, other than that, it, it will not clutter my UI. So all I have to do is click on the archive. I now have no failed messages. Going back again, clean dashboard, a message that the failed message was archived. Going back to the Service Insight UI, refreshing, I now can see that, yep, this is the message, and it is now archived. The conversation itself is marked as completed uh, with an archive message. Okay. So this is what uh, this is. There are these are the capabilities of Service Pulse when it comes to uh, processing uh, or reprocessing failed messages or archiving failed messages, providing you with a full stack full stack trace information and allowing you to visualize what's going on in the entire conversation and seeing the context, the message body, the various headers, how this message relates to other messages using Service Insight. Last topic uh, before we move on to the planning and uh, configuration, con configuration section is the issue of activity monitoring with endpoint performance counters. Now endpoint performance counters are um, exist for quite a while and they come out of the box with end service bus. Whenever you install an end service bus endpoint, you have the option on by default to install those um, those uh, performance counters. Uh, those performance counters are per endpoint, so collecting that information is something you do per endpoint and you need to, co to collect them into a central display, uh, but that can be provided by any third-party monitoring tool out there that provide uh, a link to the various uh, performance counters. And what do we supply out of the box? Well, there's the number of failed messages per second, there's the messages pulled from the queue per second so it provides me with indication of how many uh, of what's the throughput of incoming uh, messages from the queue and also throughput in terms of how many messages I successfully processed per second. There's also the issue of critical time which provides me with an indication of how long it took me to process uh, those messages specifically it provides me uh, it indicates in the performance counters uh, the age of the oldest message in the queue for that specific time span that is covered by the performance counter so for example if I'm encountering a situation where messages are processed uh, only after only 10 seconds or 15 seconds and then 20 30 etc etc increasing in 
increasing time spans since um, those messages were sent to the time uh, they were uh, processed successfully, that may indicate that I have a problem and my critical time is growing. Now, critical time is growing may in indicates that um, I'm um, about to face issues. Those issues may also include SLA, service level uh, agreement failures. For example, I may decide that a specific set of messages handled by a specific set of endpoints is uh, subject to a specific uh, time restrictions. Those messages must be processed within, let's say, 10 seconds of, their, uh, of them being sent. So if I, um, if I breach this SLA, I would like to know that. What this performance count does is it um, detects that SLA, compares it to the critical time, and provides me with an indication of how many seconds remain until the SLA for that endpoint is breached. It's sort of a countdown uh, display of when, it, when the counted re countdown reaches at zero or it's on its way to zero, then I should pay attention to it. So this is the, the activity monitoring that comes out of the box with uh, end service bus. And now let's um, discuss planning and configuration of service bus, topic by topic. Let's start with specifying custom domain or host names or port number. So First of all, by default, after you install Service Pulse and uh, Service Control, uh, we're secure by default in the sense that we're limiting ourselves to local host only, local host port three, three, th five times three for Service Control in 1990 for uh, Service Pulse. That's the default. These are the default ports. And the classic first thing that you'd like to do is possibly change the domain names, uh, whether it's uh, a uh, public domain or whether it's a uh, custom host name that you'd like to use that can be configured and quite easily but once you do that you're basically uh, defining or expanding the scope of uh, exposure of the data that is exposed by service control and service pulse so what you need to take into consideration is what is the right level of exposure and how do I want to limit that exposure to the service control data to various personnel for example I may want to um, I may, I may not want to expose uh, the message body, only the metadata. I may not want. I may may have not may not have a problem exposing the message body, but there are specific fields within specific messages, specific property within specific messages that I do not want to expose. Like for example, the credit card property, credit card number property in the purchase order message. So that may be uh, encrypted. And I may want to limit uh, visibility or limit access to various uh, components or overall require, for example, VPN uh, administration, uh, VPN authentication and authorization. So how to do that, that is something, uh, there is an article online that describes in depth how to, what are the options. Uh, the link to that article or to the set of articles that define the um, Actually, the checklist for configuring and planning for service pulse and service control uh, will appear in a second in the uh, in the slide. Next topic is the issue of capacity and storage. Now, storage requirements. Well, storage is required, of course, for the embedded RavenDB database that uh, underlies the functionality provided by. Um, Service control. Service Pulse itself does not have a database. It relies exclusively on the information provided by Service Control. So the Service Control database is uh, embedded database is the um, storage um, consumer in this scenario, and the storage size required varies varies significantly uh, based on various requirements. Very significant significantly between uh, one system and the other. Um, factors that affect it is uh, message body size, etc. So what you can do is, of course, uh, specify a storage location, and you need to consider that storage location from multiple perspectives, specifically performance. Where you locate the embedded database uh, may affect performance. For example, if that storage uh, location is uh, too distant, the communication uh, latency is too high between the service control instance service instance and the database it connects to. And there's also security concerns because access to the database files means access to the data. So you need to have both a storage location that is uh, close, fast, um, provides enough room for growth based on your policy, and also is secure so that it is not uh, accessible to unauthorized personnel. 
Um, regarding maximum capacity limitations, well, the underlying RavenDB embedded database that we're using can store up to 16 uh, terabytes. And based on our analysis and calculations, that's, n that's more than enough for all the scenarios we've seen so far. And uh, I guess this is a nice segue to discuss audited messages expiration. Service Pulse uh, stores or performs recent history auditing, meaning that it stores information regarding um, the messages and the activities going on in your system for the recent history. What's recent? Well, by default, it's 30 days. It keeps information that is 30 days old or younger, and it, that uh, time span is configurable. You can specify whatever number of days you'd like, and we urge you to consider the implications based on your throughput, message sizes, etc. You can play around with it, see how much storage is required based on your uh, estimated uh, throughput, and uh, adjust the configuration accordingly. Um, you can set the message expiration uh, from a simple configuration setting. And just a note, the message expiration applies only to audited messages, successfully audited messages. It does not apply to failed or archived messages. These are not purged, they are stored forever. So that at any point in the future, if you recall that there was a failed message that you'd like to go back to, you, you'll always find it regardless of whether or not you specified a message expiration that may have affected other successfully audited messages that are of the same age. And I guess the next question after discussing message expiration is what happens when, regarding long-term storage or customized auditing? And these are two related topics, a second, that can be solved in the, uh, using the same feature. Uh, first of all, long-term storage. Um, for some scenarios, you may want to store uh, messages for long periods. Um, policy or regulatory requirements may specify periods uh, spanning years, seven years is a common number of storing various messages and for logging, logging purposes. So you may be uh, required to abide by those requirements. And there are many uh, systems and tools and storage options that provide you with uh, cost-effective tools for such long-term and large-scale storage of um, <clears throat> of audited messages. Um, in addition, and for somewhat uh, different, um, different goal, you may have or you may want to access the uh, messages that are being audited for various other purposes. You may have written your own custom auditing tool or custom management tool that you'd like to keep on using alongside Service Pulse and Service Control, or you may want to consume those, uh, in, those uh, messages and uh, examine them uh, for some other purposes, for example, operational BI, that's also possible. So for these two uh, goals and possibly others as well, <clears throat> there's the option of specifying a secondary uh, set of queues of audit queues, we refer to as audit.log and error.log, that service control will forward the messages it receives to those queues so that as service control consumes the original messages audited to the original audit and error queues, it will also copy those messages transactionally to uh, the audit.log and error.log queues. And you can find all the messages service control pro uh, audits in those messages as well and do as you wish with them. Now, um, you need to consider whether to use it or not. Um, error.log is defined as on by default meaning that you, need, do, you do not need to do anything whenever you install service control, it will always be on and waiting for you, containing all the various failed messages. Uh, we assume that, that the number of failed messages will not be too large to um, place your storage limitations in jeopardy, but please keep, the, keep that in mind. On the other hand, audit.log is off by default, so if you want to turn it on, then please be aware of that and do so. It's a simple configuration option on the service control uh, configuration file. And that's how you can override the fact uh, that uh, service pulse and service control consume the information uh, or the messages that are uh, audited to the central uh, error queues 
if you in some way rely on them or would like to rely on them for other purposes, this is the workaround and how you can continue to do so while still enjoying the benefits of using Service Pulse. Okay, um, next topic I'd like to discuss is performance and throughput. Um, let's start with throughput. The, well, the number of messages that service control uh, can consume uh, is extremely is an extremely important one since um, service control is required to withstand the aggregate number of all of the messages uh, processed by all of the messages all of the endpoints it audits. So if you have ten endpoints, each consumes each processes a hundred messages per second then the aggregate is a thousand messages per second and that is what service control needs to uh, be able to process. So uh, this is uh, what we refer to as the throughput of service control and the throughput varies significantly from input from transport to transport and of course it is also impacted by various other uh, factors like message size and machine strength etc. But in general based on our um, unofficial uh, performance uh, measurements, we've seen that currently MSMQ uh, for service control handles um, about uh, 5,000 messages per second, SQL Server about 1,000 to 2,000, and we're working on, on it to reach the throughput uh, that is similar or that is much higher, um, similar to MSMQ or even more or even faster and similarly the other transports as well. But again, this needs to be uh, considered based on your scenarios since um, there are many factors that affect the throughput. Regarding performance in terms uh, performance impact of the plugins themselves, you may, have, you may be asking yourselves, well, I have my endpoints and they are processing an X number of messages per second. What will be the overhead of adding the various plugins? Well, let's think about it for a second. There's the heartbeat plugins, and the heartbeat sends by default one message per 10 seconds, or six messages per minute, or etc. No, that's not a big deal. Um, there's the there are the custom checks, and that basically depends on you, on your specific decisions on how and how often to implement the custom checks and how many, and you need to consider that as well. And uh, for Saga auditing, and I've covered Saga auditing in depth in the previous webinar, but basically Saga auditing, what Saga auditing does is it uh, connects to Sagas, to workflows, and whenever a, a Saga is invoked, it uh, reports about that, it sends an audit message, a message about that. So that Saga auditing is somewhat heavier than custom checks and heartbeat, so it, it sends a message per Saga invocation which may be a lot depending on your implementation of sagas. So you need to take that into consideration and um, plan accordingly. Next topic is backing up, is backup, specifically backup of the uh, embedded, da embedded database. So that's quite simple. You need to copy the database files and make arrangement to copy those files. Uh, first you need to temporarily stop the service control Windows service and perform a copy operation, a simple copy operations on operation on the um, on the database files themselves and then restart the, the uh, endpoint. It takes about a second, uh, well depending on your size, on the size of the data. And note that stopping the service control service uh, does not cause any loss of any data loss since the messages await and wait in the queues until the service control instance is uh, up and running again. And Another question that is being raised um, repeatedly is the issue of RavenDB management. The underlying database used by service by service control is uh, RavenDB, and there is no need to learn or manage the RavenDB uh, that comes with uh, service control. It's uh, completely embedded. Um, this is something that uh, does not you do not need to handle or uh, access yourselves. It is possible to access it. Again, documentation can be uh, accessed in the developer portal for all of the topics I've discussed, including uh, how to access the management uh, tools for the, Raven, for the embedded RavenDB. However, it, it is not intended to be accessed directly, especially not to be modified directly, but it is possible. And in any case, it is not required that you have RavenDB experience. It's something that comes as an embedded part of uh, service pulse. So these are, this is sort of a checklist uh, that I have in mind when 
thinking about a service pulse implementation and deployment and I urge you to uh, consider these topics and other topics covered in the developer portal. You see the links before you. Please feel free to use them. And there's uh, the general portal that provides additional information about Service Matrix, Service Insight, and of course, and Service Bus. Um, we've in, we're current. We're continuing to invest a lot in in adding uh, to the to the documentation and guidance inside the developer portal. And please let us know if you um, find anything missing. If you need anything that you cannot find in the developer portal, if you wanna, if you want us to uh, direct you in the right uh, path to find a specific set of documentation, or if something is missing, please please let us know. We are eager to make our guidance uh, better and more comprehensive. Training is another uh, feature we're working hard on. There are various uh, training events, uh, including NSB conference that uh, will uh, be held in London in, in June, uh, June 26th, in about two weeks, and also in New York in uh, September. Regarding support, there are various support options, both uh, free support and non-critical support. Uh, and of course, critical 24/7 with uh, response time uh, commitment support that you can purchase, and of course, licensing information, which uh, you can review, and uh, that more or less covers the topics that I wanted to discuss. Uh, we've went through the agenda. We've discussed the platform architecture and overview. We've seen how heartbeats behave, the custom checks, and the how to how to access dependencies, exceptions and errors, and online activity monitoring with performance counters, and of course planning and configuring. And with that, let's uh, go to the Q and A. Okay. Adam asks, if archived exceptions are persisted indefinitely, how can they be purged? Does it require a manual interaction with RavenDB, or can this be done via service pulse? Well, in the in the in the future, it will be uh, done. Uh, we'll add a purging feature, manual purging feature, inside of Service Pulse. But uh, we would like to do that using specific, highly um, authenticated and authorized personnel. And this is something we'd like to uh, add in a future uh, version, near future version. But currently, archived uh, messages are kept uh, indefinitely, like failed messages. The assumption is that uh, it will not uh, be uh, taking too uh, much uh, space for the uh, foreseeable future in most of the scenarios we've seen. And in any case, if there's a need to, there's always the possibility of providing a manual uh, or a scripted uh, purchasing pur purge. Just contact us and we'll provide you with the guidelines. Sean asks, can I get service control throughput on Azure, storage queues, and service bus? Uh, yes, but I strongly urge that you test it based on your specific requirements. I've tried to uh, get a uh, very specific number, but it varies. It varies significantly because there are simply so many uh, variables when accessing the cloud. First of all, it depends on how strong is the machine that you're currently uh, running on. And um, there's also the distance between the, the location and the of the, the various data centers. I've seen fluctuations in the throughput. In general, um, what I suggest uh, you do is uh, you basically take your specific scenario, implement it, see whether it uh, re it reaches the throughput that you uh, require. Contact us if you require any. Uh, um, assistance and configuration, or if you feel that the throughput does not reach your uh, specific requirements. Uh, but it really is something that I do not feel comfortable uh, even providing you with an unofficial quote, simply because on the cloud, uh, throughput is so is very so, very so much and depends on so many um, unstable variables. Devon asks, we have an enterprise dashboard. Can we subscribe or push the alerts in the particular dashboard to our dashboard? Excellent questions. Uh, question, yes. Um, 
first of all, uh, this uh, aligns with the issue of uh, ex uh, customizing uh, the notifications and alerts and hooking into the various alerts, whether it's uh, by pulling the data from service control or, for some, or from service pulse or by receiving push notifications in various forms, whether it's SignalR or whether it's uh, events or uh, other mechanisms, webhooks, for example, uh, from service control. We're currently working on finalizing the details on this. Um, there's uh, a demo that is uh, accessible, and you can get a link to it where we can provide it. And we are also planning on having a dedicated webinar uh, in the near future specifically discussing these topics of extensibility and customization of uh, the underlying information, underlying events, and how to hook those into your own uh, enterprise dashboards. If you need the details right now, then just ping us offline and we'll provide you with the uh, links and assistance and guidance in how to implement that. Wes asks, how should the operations team manage settings like SLAs, warning thresholds, etc.? Well, first of all, these SLAs currently are marked. Uh, SLAs currently uh, are uh, endpoint SLAs. These are the performance counters SLA I've described, and these are uh, specified within configuration settings inside of each endpoint. So this is something that can be marked in the configuration files of each endpoint. And how to monitor that? The best way of monitoring that is by uh, registering and consuming the performance counters of each endpoint. And this can be done by practically every um, general purpose monitoring tool that's out there. Uh, we are uh, considering various other more extended SLAs, but that's something we'll provide in a future version. Uh, things like, for example, process SLAs and uh, more uh, fine-grained SLAs per message or per conversation. Um, but currently, the SLAs that are available are marked as part of the performance counters, as we've seen, and that's something that's configurable through configuration through each endpoint's configuration file. I got a question from Brian. I, he he writes, if we already have a license for in service bus, do we automatically have a license for service pulse and service insight? Um, not sure, but in general, the licensing for service pulse uh, is uh, sold uh, as a uh, as another offering. We have additions, so in service pulse, pulse by itself is the standard edition, and service pulse uh, alongside so in service bus is the advanced edition, and service insight comes with the enterprise edition. So please uh, visit the pro the licensing page on our website for more details. It really depends on uh, and the kind of license that you have and the various details uh, of it. And uh, we'll make sure that you fully understand the, uh, the additions, the offering, offering that, offerings that we have. And if something is not understood from the website itself, there's a big contact us button. Uh, please use it and we'll get back to you as soon as possible with uh, clarifications. Naeem asks, how can we use service control from our own dashboard to monitor service heartbeat? Again, this is something that um, can be done by using extensibility points. Let me give an example for a second. Um, okay, so um, local host, let's. Uh, Okay, so this is a, an HTTP API uh, that accesses the list of endpoints. And I can see basically that I've got heartbeat information here, and I can see when it was last reported. I've got the timestamp here, and the reported status is beating. So I have this information available either, in this case, it's a pull of the endpoints API, or I can also do that using uh, push uh, by hooking into various other uh, options. Um, so this is what we're currently planning on releasing and providing you, both pull and push uh, um, access to the underlying HTTP, to the underlying API that you can connect to your various um, 
dashboard custom tools um, extend or even replace uh, whatever components you'd like uh, and enhance them with uh, this data. Currently, I would like to comment that uh, this, uh, these APIs, we're marking them as being in the status of technology preview, not because they're not stable, they are, but uh, we are um, interested in, in tweaking them and making sure they are uh, completely stable and abide by our very strict backwards compatibility commitments. So we will uh, release them shortly in a, in a, very, in a, in a, in a future uh, release, but um, currently you can start using them while being aware that there may be minor changes that will affect this API. Hopefully that answers your question. If not, then please, uh, again, contact us uh, offline regarding how to access those API. We'd like to both know about the scenarios you have in mind so that we can tweak those APIs to suit those scenarios and make sure that they're used properly. And also to make sure that you uh, have a good insight about the future um, directions that we're planning regarding those extensibility uh, points and access to the underlying API. Again, we will also have a webinar uh, in the near future uh, addressing these topics in depth, how to access the underlying service control information using the uh, API, whether it's a pull API or push API. Okay, looks like that's all the questions that we have. Thanks everybody for uh, attending. Um, I wanted to remind you again of something that Danny touched on. NSP, uh, NSB Con London is just two weeks away and it'll include a healthy mix of sessions from our team, our partners and customers, and of course top speakers like Udi Dahan, Greg Young, and James Lewis. Go to nsbcon.com for more details. And for those of you in North America, NSBCon is coming to New York September 29th and 30th. And we'll have uh, speakers including Udi Dahan, uh, Oren Ayeni, Ted Neward, and more. For registration details on uh, the upcoming conference in New York, uh, go to our courses and events page at particular.net. So join us next time when we'll talk about uh, extending and service bus, service control, and service pulse. And that's it for today. On behalf of Danny Cohen, this is Brett King saying so long for now, and we'll see you on the next particular live webinar.